Thank goodness. Okay. Um, so we have about an hour and a half scheduled for this, or we have an hour and a half scheduled for this presentation. We do not expect it to go an hour and a half. At least our content um, is not going to go an hour and a half. We wanted to leave ample time to um, for questions. We want this to be um, as open, you know, dialogue as possible. And the only other thing I wanted to mention before we get started is that um, you guys will have um Jillian Lee with Western she's going to be watching for questions in the audience and so you can either raise your hand or you can write in the chatter box and we will um be watching those and making sure that we're answering all of your guys's questions so today we asked um Sika and Roof Tech Consulting to join us um, to help talk about this topic. Um, they're dealing with this on a regular basis, just as much as you know the contractors are. So we wanted to get an overall um, view of what is going on. Um, and so there, for me personally, if somebody tells me that my you know project went up in price or that um, it's going to be longer lead time than I was expected, for me, I want to understand the why behind that. And so that's really the reason that we developed this um, education today is for that all of you guys, the end buyers, the end users can actually will understand, you know, why this is going on. And so before we get started, I wanted to just quickly hand this over to Crystal Moyer. Um, she wants to make a brief introduction and then we'll get started. Hi, yeah, thank you, Tanya. Um, I just wanted to be able to quickly introduce myself this is a great topic and it's a very popular topic right now. And as we think about the um, significance of the situations that we're all dealing with, I just wanted to make sure that all of you on the call understood the resources that were available to you. Um, as I looked at the attendee list, it looks like many of you are from all over the United States. And um, many of you are, are already part of our national account partners. So if Anytime during the presentation, whenever you're listening to our panel of experts, if you have any questions or you need help getting in touch with your local point of contact, you can feel free to reach out to me and we will get you pointed in the right direction. And I will share my contact information in the chat box. And um, that's it. Thank you again for attending. I'll hand it back over to you, Tanya. All right. Thank you, Crystal. I went ahead and turned off my camera because I know that I was getting a little bit of a lag. So um, we have several professionals joining us today, um, several from Western Roof Tech and also from Sika. I'm going to let everybody introduce themselves as they um, answer their first questions. I'm going to hand this over to Mike Mastro um, and he's going to give a uh, he's going to provide uh, his introduction. Go ahead, Mike. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Michael Mastro. I'm the vice president of Sika Corporation's what we call refurbishment, sealing, and bonding. So really all the concrete repair, the waterproofing stuff, uh, and I handle the entire company on uh, the, whole, the whole country for those products. Um, are we going to jump around now, Tanya, and do intros, or do you want to roll right into the presentation? No, if you can go ahead and roll into the presentation in the beginning of the panel discussion, we'll have um, all of the panelists introduce okay. themselves. So you can go ahead to the next slide. You know, really the, the backbone of what we want to do today is just kind of fill everybody in on, obviously everybody's aware of the supply issues, the supply chain issues that are currently out there. And it's not just our industry, right? We're looking at roofing, we're looking at repair. You're looking at, you know, Home Depot, Lowe's, everywhere where construction products are being used, really any products are being used, there's a significant backup or bottleneck. Uh, and it's important for you to understand how it started uh, the things that have aggravated it and really where it's going. Um, so we're going to talk about the supply updates for 2021. We'll talk about the freeze that everybody heard of and, and really how it affected us. You can go to the next slide. So coming into 2021, before the freeze even took part, we knew as an industry that there were going to be some major hurdles for us to overcome. So take yourselves back over a year ago prior to when COVID started. The market was pretty robust. Things were looking pretty good. Um, you know, I think everybody had a strong backload, backlog of projects. And then COVID hits and everything shuts down. Sadly enough, a lot of these raw material manufacturers did not take their foot off the gas when it comes to producing raw materials. So here they are producing at normal rates. And in essence, what we had was in April or March and April and in May, where the volume of work just fell off, right? We couldn't even you know, work in some conditions in New York City and Boston, 
places like LA, San Francisco, they shut us down completely. So now we have this huge pile of raw materials and nowhere to put them. So what ended up happening with the, you know, the raw materials, as with a lot of companies at that same time during COVID, they were forced to lay people off, to furlough people. In some cases, they were shuttering uh, existing plants. So this is where, let's say you had a PVC plant where they ran two or three different side-by-side -side plants. They're shutting down existing plants. They don't have the workforce um, you know, to keep them running, nor do they need to. So what happened was we had a huge volume of raw materials, nowhere to put them. The prices were driven down in a short term, and we kind of started plotting our way through the year. So at the time we're dealing with the COVID issues, we're also dealing with the, the large volume of hurricanes that we had last year, which really has a major effect, not only on raw materials, but the oil industry. And you're starting to get some, some bottlenecks throughout. So coming into 2021, we already knew we had an issue. If you look at this slide, this is just looking at the US refinery operating rates. And if you look at that yellow line, uh, that's, that's 2020 as a whole, which is far below the five-year average of how efficient these plants are running. That one big blue dip that you see there, that's the freeze that occurred in Texas. And you know, before the freeze even started, like I said, we were operating at a reduction of 25 to 30% when it comes to the refinery operations, which is really the guiding factor um, in the industry. So you, know, you had a he heavy issue, then the freeze happens. And a lot of people say, well, a freeze happened in Texas. So what the hell does that mean for me? I'm not in Texas. Well, here's a couple of pictures. This was, you know, winter storm Uri and basically what they call a hundred year storm. If you look at some of these pictures, these are real pictures of real plants that were impacted. So the bottom left-hand corner there, you see a plant that has ice on every square inch, the entire building all the way through. These buildings weren't designed for this. So you had pipes that burst, electricity's out, um, water's flowing, things are freezing. It's a total, total disaster. The sad truth is the majority of plants or manufacturing plants are built around the oil industry, meaning that a lot of these raw materials, PVC, polyol, MDI, TDI, you name it, they basically are centered around oil and that's centered around Texas. So, you know, when we look at something, let's say like epoxy resins, there's only two or three guys in the entire world that make these resins, right? And so most of it is centralized here in Texas. So when Texas went down, it wasn't just a short-term impact. It had severe, severe implications in the industry. You can go to the next slide. So, you know, when we started to look at it, you had a bunch of different things that all came together at once for the perfect storm. You had, you know, a building of momentum in the back half of 2020, where the, the business really started to pick up again. And so demand started to increase. Plants were starting to get back online, but weren't really putting the pedal to the metal. And then you have this, this cold that hits. So we have the record breaking cold. You got extensive damage to the, the machinery. You've got line shutdowns. You've got loss of power, utilities, feeds, the whole nine yards. So you have a couple of things that happen there. One thing is you got to get these plants back up and running. So if you saw some of those plants, it's not just a matter of turning the heat on and you know thawing everything out and then starting over. If any of you have ever had an insurance claim at your house or building or something that you're aware of, getting the insurance company to come out there and do an assessment does not take a week, right? And none of these places are gonna go ahead on their own and repair it without having the insurance company. So you have a huge backlog of insurance claims. We gotta get the electricity started again. We gotta get the water started again. In some cases, you know, we got complex things such as chlorine or nitrogen, which have specific needs when you're when you're packaging them off. So there's a lot of different complicated issues that came together. So once we were able, or some of these companies were able to restart these plants and start making raw materials, it's not flip the switch and we're right back to 100% production either. It starts at about 20% for a month and it flows to about 40% for a month. And what that means for a company like mine, we let's say um, we usually order 100,000 metric tons of a raw material to make product. In March, I was getting 100,000 metric tons, then the freeze hit. In April, I got about 20,000 metric tons, right? So they start to allocate you. Well, we can only provide you with so much. 
So now we have to provide our, our operations teams and our production teams and say, look, this is what we have. This is the ingredients to the cookies, which means we can only make so many cookies. And that's where those time lags start to create because on top of everything else, the demand that we're comparing it to is a demand in last year in April and May that was so severely affected by COVID, naturally you're gonna grow. So we're looking at an, a, an increased demand year over year of about 20%, but a, a reduction in the ability to manufacture by as much as 80%. So it really is this big buffer that we're trying to fill holes in. On top of all that, you have the shipping issues, right? So you know now you have raw materials, you have, and now you gotta get it from one place to the next. This is another major, major issue that doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. So first of all, we had to be able to open up the roads and the trucking terminals and everything in Texas and around Texas. And then you have to get it somewhere. So we had limited amounts of drivers, limited amounts of containers, right? Everybody's heard that there's container shortages everywhere throughout the world. You know, you don't have the containers in the right place at the right time. It's a problem. So this entire supply chain from beginning to end really started to get bottlenecked and affected. And it created a kind of a, a, an implosion at one point. You can go to the next slide. So if you look at specific on the left-hand side there, you're just looking at some specific raw materials. Once the outage happened, this, this is what we were getting on average. So TDI, which goes into polyurethane uh, production, uh, we're getting 78%, or actually in that case, we were still getting 100%. But as you go down that list, you start to see, in some cases, we were getting only 50% of what we would normally need just to maintain average demand in the past. Now, when you add to the fact that we had 20% more demand, it really exacerbates the problem. You know, at first they were expecting two to four weeks of downtime, right, for these outages in, in order to get the power back on. In some cases, it took six weeks, eight weeks. Um, they weren't able to really start plants back up. You know, the cracker and refinery business was highly affected, um, ethylene and propylene. So, you know, what's funny is in a normal year, I would tell you a company like Sika Corporation, I know there's some folks on here from Master Builders, you know, every year we probably see one, maybe two raw materials that become somewhat scarce or maybe there's a plant shut down and so it's scheduled. Um, right now, we're currently tracking over 77 raw materials that are either unavailable or on allocation. So going from one to 77, you can imagine has become a full-time job for people like me. It's a huge communication thing. We have to now go out. And it's no longer just about availability. It's now about cost, right? So now you have all these, these guys that own these wonderful raw material companies saying, hold on a minute. If I put my pedal to the metal again and the, and the industry dips, I'm going to have to take a price increase because I'm going to have all this stuff and know where to sell it. So what we're going to do is we're going to put our, our foot on the pedal about halfway. We're going to cruise at about five to 10 miles an hour under the speed limit. We're going to make some raw materials. We're going to supply people. But what we're going to do in the short term is we have to hike up the prices because we shuttered the plants that we could have used to provide this volume, but now we don't have that. And just like you guys and everybody on this call that have a hard time hiring people in this environment, they can't get people to come in. A lot of these plant workers would rather sit at home and play video games and collect government money than come in for $18 an hour and run a production line. And that's really the biggest uh, resource gap that we have right now is getting people to come back in to run these lines. And it's not just on the raw material side, it's on the manufacturer side as well. So you can go on to the next one, Tanya. So if we looked at something like polyurethanes, you start to look at, you know, this slide here shows you all the different things that go into something of simple like polyurethane production, right? So you got propylene, you got benzenes, you've got this, you've got that. You've got all these different raw materials. It's not one or two. Just like you're baking cookies, it's flour, it's sugar, it's all these different things that come together. And if one thing in that chain gets disrupted, it disrupts everything. And the problem is right now, it's not one thing, it's several things. So what you see here is, you know, what we have is critical pass where, you know, look, if it's red, then right now we're, we're in a tough spot. If it's yellow, it could be a problem down the road. If it's green, we're okay. Go to the next slide, Tanya. And it changes regularly. So in something like polyurethane, you know, this is the type of feedback that we were getting. Two weeks into the mess, they were saying all key feedstocks and all raw materials that go into this stuff are in critical supply. Meaning if you can get it, you're getting it in limited quantities and the price is significantly higher. 
So I can tell you for certain things like epoxy resin, the cost difference between November and today is between two and 300%, right? So, you know, you're seeing in the industry, some you're seeing surcharges, you're seeing price increases, some to the tune of a couple percent, some to the tune of 20%, depending on what they are. But in no way, shape or form are you normally seeing 200 or 300%, you know, increases in these raw material costs or these costs, these product costs. So the, a lot of people are absorbing these. We're trying to absorb as much as we can down the line, but it requires everybody to kind of pitch in. Um, you know, a month later, they're saying, okay, we've got the utilities back on. We're starting to get back online, but we still have some shortages and there's still going to be allocation. So in a month into this, you were still probably only getting 80, you know, 20 percent. You're, you're missing 80 percent of what you really need to, to meet demand. Two months into it, you know, it's starting to get better. There's a little improvement, but not much. You know, originally in March and April, they believed that we would be out of this by June or July. I can tell you that in some cases, it you know, some things have come back. Uh, in some cases, we're lucky enough to have product brought in from other countries, whether it's Korea or China, uh, Germany, you name it. Um, if we have the ability or if the companies have the ability, they're using every, every resource they can to bring it in, but it's at a cost. And the problem with bringing it in from other places is the same container issues, the same shipping issues, the same you know supply chain issues that we have in the US, they're having globally. So case in point right now, we're trying to ship over raw materials from China, which would normally take about two to four weeks. Right now, you can expect that same load to take eight to 16, depending on what it is, right? So it's significantly drawn out and it's creating lead time issues. You can go to the next slide. So the next slide really shows, this is where they were, they were thinking that the material supply was gonna track. So if you look at the bottom, I know it's, a, it's an eye chart, it's hard to see, but that last date on there that looks like we're gonna be back to 100% capacity is right about now. I can tell you we're not even close, right? The industry, you know, every time we make progress on one raw material, something else comes down the line and you don't realize how many things this goes into, you know, um, you know, first you're talking about, you know, MDI or TDI, things that make plastics. And so now we can make the products, but I can't get the packaging to put the product in because the product packaging uses MDI too. So it's this huge chain of issues. Um, something as simple as nitrogen. We have a shortage in nitrogen right now. Why is that important? Well, if any of you have ever used liquid waterproofing, um, when they pack that stuff into five gallon pails, they put a blanket of nitrogen on top of it so that it doesn't cure in the pail, if that makes sense. If I can't get the nitrogen, I can't pack those pails off. So it's this whole series of events that it takes place and, and every single thing is getting affected at this rate. But it is looking a little bit better. What's not looking better is the pricing in certain cases. I would tell you with the, you know, specifically if you look at something like epoxy resin and hardener, We've seen increases on those types of raw materials every two weeks since November. And the bottom line is this, these people sit there, they have it, and they say, look, your price today is $18. You go, oh man, come on, $18. They go, hey, listen, if you don't want it, it's okay. There's people standing behind you, $18 and we'll get it down. So they kind of have you a little bit uh, and they're turning the screws, but at the end of the day, I think, um, there's a lot of progress being made. It's just going to take some time. In the meantime, you know, lead times are getting drawn out significantly. I can tell you for you know, a company like mine, we're not just producing for my demand. There's a lot of smaller companies that can't produce at all. So we're producing for their demand as well. If you look at this chart here, this shows you specifically, you know, which products are affected. And you're even seeing some major effects now in what we call LATAM, which is Latin America. So a lot of this stuff, which gets exported now, we can't export it because we don't have it. Um, so adhesive systems, you know, we're getting about 64% of what we need. Uh, cement, we're only, you know, we're only seeing a, a, a decline in probably 10% of our, our products. Um, concrete, not so much of an issue. Thermoplastics is the big one. Here, we can't get anything. And this is your plastics. Your, you know, so if you guys are, you know, I, I know there's some roofing folks on here, PVC roofs, TPO roofs, the stuff that goes into making that stuff, it's just so scarce, it's difficult to get, and they can't make rolls of it. So they're having to pick and choose what they want to do. Um, you know, I, yes. 
the thermoplastic, and correct me if I'm wrong, like that's even talking about like the containers that caulk and, you know, all these different things come in, correct? It, it basically, it, use that as plastics, anything that's plastic, mm -hmm. right? So it's a lot of different things that are getting, you know, sorted. And again, like I said, in past years, in the 23 years I've done this, maybe one or two products for a month or so become not even scarce, but, you know, more difficult to get. Now it's, hey, listen, you know, you, you, you use 100,000 pounds, we're going to give you 10. Is that okay? Listen, I'll take what I can get. We're working, you know, you have to work with other companies to see if you can trade. I mean, it really is something that gets worked on. We have a, a basically a crisis team that does this every day. We talk to procurement, we talk to vendors, we talk to customers. We're doing our best to try to manage it. Um, and we've realized going into the field that a lot of times that's not communicated to people on this call. So all you're hearing is, I can't start this week. It's going to cost you 10% more, you know, but but not why, right? And, and not what the outlook looks. I think, you know, if you really want to put it in perspective, I think everybody on this call, I'm sure, has been to Home Depot or Lowe's in the last 90 days. If you haven't, I'll give you a little hint. If you need to buy a piece of plywood today, what you were paying $15 for a year ago, you're paying $95 for today. You can't get it. And when you can get it, the quality is horrible. So there's significant, you know, it's not just our industry. It's lumber, you know, for the roofing people, right? It's sheet metal, it's fasteners, it's shingles, it's lumber. It's all these different things that are coming into it. And it's kind of like, you know, any project, I need everything to start the project. I can't do a deck coating project if I have the base coat and the top coat, but I don't have the primer. So if I don't have the primer, we can't do anything. And that's really what's happening in a lot of these construction jobs is we don't have the ability to put the entire package together in some of these jobs. So it creates a little bit of a, you know, of a delay. You know, again, we have the COVID-19 effect. You know, we've got significant driver shortage, transit delays. You know, on the e-commerce side, Lowe's and Home Depot, they had huge consumer demand last year, huge. I would say that that business probably grew in excess of 40 or 50 percent last year for some of those companies. Uh, and, and a lot of that truck volume, that rail volume went to them because that's where the money was. Um, we're having import challenges. We can't get containers. You know, volume increases. Believe it or not, that the stupid, you know, freighter that got stuck in the Suez Canal backed up over 360 freighters that were supposed to come through there. That's a time lag, right? At one point, we were, we have a picture of Los Angeles Harbor, and there were over 50 freight liners sitting there anchored not able to unload because they don't have the people or the resources at the port to unload them. So now, for all I know, your material could be sitting on that container and we can't even offload it. They sit there for months. Um, you know, the weather impacted it between the severe weather in the Midwest, the embargoes, the Texas winter storm, it all created this perfect storm of mess. If, if we had demand like we had last year during COVID, it wouldn't be so much of an issue but the business is coming back. And so you've got a stretch in demand and a shortage of supply, which just makes that gap so much bigger. Go ahead, Tony, you can go to the next slide. Yeah. This is Jillian. We have a question in the chat bar. It's pretty long if you want to take a look. Let me look at it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I figured it'd be a lot easier to read than me just uh, broadcast yeah, it. No problem. What? What consideration is being given to non-metallic rebar over traditional rebar, considering price increases? How about structural fibers? It's a good question. So I can't, I can't specifically talk about if the engineering community is looking at non-metallic over regular, but I, I would guarantee you, anybody that has a, product, a project stoppage or, or, or significant time delay would be willing to substitute whatever they can to get the job done. Case in point, a lot of what we're doing, Patrick, is even within chemical companies like myself, we're looking at alternative sources. We're looking at alternative raw materials, right? Um, and it's not so simple. It's not just, hey, I bought this sugar for the cookies and now I'm going to use a different sugar. When it comes to material manufacturing, it's not that simple because anything that you replace could affect the physical properties of what you're selling. And so there's a lot of R&D testing that has to be done beforehand. I can tell you we've reformulated a whole bunch of things using identical raw materials. You won't see the difference in the field, but we're able to produce it. 
Granted, it probably costs us a little bit more. So, you know, I would imagine if you're talking to, to specifiers and you can get non-metallic rebar and that's what's holding up your job, I strongly suggest you consider it because if you don't, you may be sitting there an awfully long time to do that job. You know, structural fibers, you know, we make those. It's, you know, I, I don't know. You'd have to really get into the calculations on what you can take out and what you can replace it with. Structural fibers you can use to help in that situation, but structural fibers can't be used as the primary force of reinforcing, if that makes sense. Right? It's kind of like carbon fiber. You can't use carbon fiber as a primary reinforcement, only a secondary. Does that answer your question? It answers the question, but the, uh, the structural fibers that we're talking about are actually being used as a replacement for regular steel. So the structural fibers which are being imported are not like the old fortifier or anything like that. That's all about crack control. These are materials that are like uh, one company in the United, the biggest company in the United States is Helix, and they produce yep. a, they they produce a metal fiber that is a structural fiber and is is basically in accordance with ACI and can be used as a structural in structural design, correct? In limited fashion, but it can be used. The materials we're talking about are being imported from Norway at the current time and are basically coming through AIT Composites, who are also making the uh, fiberglass and the basalt rebar. Uh, which is being used uh, for bridges all over the United States. So uh, it's it's a major major consideration for both new construction and restoration. Even absolutely, ice it's yeah. I'm thinking more uh, the old school polypropylene. Those fibers you oh, can't use yeah. to to pick up those loads. If you can, if the calculations meet it, and you can reduce, maybe you're just reducing the amount of steel, but you can certainly do that. Um, yeah. Just to give you one one example. We're currently doing a 250,000 uh, square foot slab down in the southeast, uh, eight inch thick industrial slab, no steel. Everything is structural fiber. Fibers. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, basically, we're seeing it's, it's, it's reinforcement out of a truck. Correct. And you're looking at, you're talking about the two, three inch fibers that they, no, they mix. No, no, no. We're They're talking, longer? We're talking about 24 millimeter, uh, max 36. So, okay. we're not, so we're talking inch, inch and a half. Okay. We're not small. Okay. Four to five was originally well over two inches. This this product is a product which is meant to be a structural product. It is a shorter fiber. It is a matter of bond and bond length. I think, you know, this problem really lends itself to the old adage, you know, um, you know, this innovation becoming, you know, a major player because you have necessity, right? So we're going to have to learn to do things differently because of what we're dealing with today. And I saw another question that came up uh, a minute ago that asked something similar. Um, you know, yeah. it, it asked the question, are, are, do you think consultants are going to go to asphalt based roofing now that single ply roofs are at an all time high? I don't think so. And I'll tell you why. Well, the extra, Mike, we have um, Kale on here. He's a consultant. He may be able to okay. answer that question. Yeah, I'll pass that on to him. But I think what you're going to find is even asphalt-based stuff now is going to be more expensive because the oil industry is going to be just as affected as we are. So, and we'll we'll jump to that. I'm trying to see if there's anything that's particular. If we're now looking for foreign materials, are you also making sure that you're not importing materials with asbestos? Without a doubt, um, there's a whole bunch of what we call EHS, the so our health and safety. Um, all raw materials, and I would say any major company that does this, all raw materials are highly vetted to make sure that they meet local standards. Um, and it's not easy because sometimes, you know, you have some of these guys that want to slip something by. That's not the case here. So I can tell you that everything's highly vetted. It's tested before anything gets done or used. Um, but it, it's a process that takes time. Yeah, Michael, I just to give you one last comment uh, because the, uh, the structural fibers have for the past four or five, these particular structural fibers have been used in the United States for bag mixes, which are currently being used for repair products on DOT projects. Yeah, so they, they've we, got, do, we do got some on the fiber structural. side. Yeah, yeah, we use some on the fiber side, not as much. Um, we tend to use more polypropylene on the plastic side, uh, talking, but there's a lot of different. We're talking to your company right now, so. Yes, <laughs> of course. I'm aware. I'm trying to make this not proprietary, but you're making it very hard for me. I didn't mention any products. I just talked about a structural fiber. <laughs> I appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you, Patrick. 
All right, so Tanya, you can pull that up. So now, you know, you look again, we talked about these delays. There's one of the pictures uh, of LA Harbor and some of the, the container trucks that are ships that are just sitting out there. Um, and so it's really a mess. I mean, it, you know, this is really the ultimate perfect storm when it comes to our industry. Go to the next well, slide, Tanya. And then, Mike, I just wanted to mention, because I thought this was pretty interesting. So you had said, and I don't think you had mentioned it yet. So they have these barges sitting out in the ocean for months and months at a time. And then once they finally get the labor to unload these barges, then they sit there in the harbor for months and months because they don't have the truck. The guys from the trucking industry, I mean, that's at 50% capacity, the trucking, I think, right now. And so then it sits there until they can find a driver to take it where it needs to go. So that's absolutely that, true. I thought that was pretty, pretty interesting. Yeah. So listen, it, it's all the way down the line. In fact, you know, there's times now that we're getting phone calls where one of our distributors or a customer has arranged to pick up product. And we'll actually half load the truck. The driver will stop us, tell us to unload the truck because somebody next door down the street offered him $800 more for that truck to use to ship their stuff. So it's just become, you know, such a, a, a tough, you know, thing to manage because it's all the way down. And you can't just focus on one thing and solve the problem. It is a holistic approach that you have to take to really create, you know, any type of impact to get us back to where we were. So um, it, it's it's really uh, it's really nuts. So and it, it's it's nothing that we've seen. This is really unprecedented. But when we look at the forecast for 2021, go to the next slide. You know, I think it's important uh, for you know for you guys to expect. Oh, Sorry, it's <laughs> okay. You can go to the next one. Okay. So the crisis is not over. Not even close to over. Um, you know, we are starting to get more raw materials. We are starting to make changes that are making it easier, but there's still a, a lag. There's still lead time issues. Um, and there's certainly going to be cost implications to all of this. You know, as we avert one crisis, another one pops itself up. So if it's not PVC, it becomes polyol. You know, if it's not epoxy resin, it's the hardener. Um, so it, there's a lot of moving parts to this, and we still have some time to work through it. I think the other problem, and it's not necessarily a problem, but something we have to identify is the demand is just way better than it was. And, and we're seeing significant growth. So, you know, right now I can't supply a lot of things on time, but our growth is still humongous. And so, you know, I think it's great that we have strong demand. It just happens to be at the wrong time because, you know, we're, we're dealing with that amidst all these, these constrictions. Uh, but, the, you know, the supply constraints might ease we expect the pricing to really not go down. I would say at, at the very best, in some cases, it'll stabilize us. But we're expecting these prices to be overly high until probably this time next year at the earliest, um, unless something drastic happens. And I would bet donuts to dollars that these guys are going to milk this for everything that they can. Um, and we're just going to have to kind of plan accordingly. All right. So what does this mean for the end user? You know, for our folks on here that are managing buildings, um, you know, you're, you're going to have to really talk. I think communication here is the key. Talk to your contractors, talk to your manufacturers, talk to your engineers, talk to your consultants, you know, find out what the impact is on your job now. Um, you know, there's going to be, you know, continue to be price implications, um, longer lead times. You know, the more communication you have as a team, the better off we are because I think we'll be able to really complete a lot of these projects uh, a lot easier. So, you know, if right now I can tell you that you're not going to get material for six weeks, at least you can plan that, right? Maybe there's something else on the job that we could focus on. Maybe there's demolition. Maybe the job can be put on hold. You know, I, I just think it's it's best. A lot of times I think as a, as a group, we try not to communicate bad information or negative information. In this case, I think we have to be honest. We have to be open, we have to be transparent, and we have to say, look, as a manufacturer, this is my limitations. As a contractor, this is my limitation. And maybe even as an owner, these are my limitations, right? So I think if we have those conversations up front, you know, we'll be able to deal a little easier with the price issues, with the, the lead time issues, um, and, and, and really still keep the demand flowing so that we don't have this pent up mess in six or eight months where we now have to you know, start doing things a little bit differently. So, um, you know, you guys can expect this to continue uh, in the short term at the very least. So 
with that, that's that's just kind of a 15,000 foot view. I really appreciate the opportunity. And certainly we can take questions, but I know we're going to jump into some specifics on the panel. So Tanya, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Mike. We really appreciate it. Um, so what Mike was doing was, was setting the stage, you know, and kind of explaining the whys behind it. Um, now I'm going to just quickly, now we have um, some questions that we thought that you guys would want to know the answer to, um, kind of what we're seeing um, as the contractor, as consultants, and then what you guys can, you know, kind of expect moving forward and how that affects you. Um, so before we get started, I wanted to go ahead and just quickly introduce um, the panel discussions um, panelist. And so, Kale, if you want to start and then Dave um, and Courtney and then um, Aaron, you guys can go ahead and Keegan, you can jump in after that. Just quickly introduce. Yes, uh, my name is Kale Prokoff. I'm the president of Rooftop Consulting as well as Pave Tech Consulting. Um, we've been in the building and closure sciences world for about 20 years. Um, obviously, like most, we've never experienced anything like this, but it has become a daily, if not hourly conversation that we're helping our clients, our client partners, our contractors navigate. So uh, we're really excited to be a part of this and, and it's, it's already bringing up a lot of very interesting points and, and hot buttons you can tell through the chat. And, um, you know, anyway, that's my introduction. Thank you, Kale. Oh, and just so you everybody knows, we'll we were not um, forgetting your questions. We will be asking them um, at the end of the panel discussion. Just so, and we'll get through all the all the questions. Um, Dave, go ahead. Hi, everybody. I'm David Gramboys. I'm with the Minneapolis branch. I'm the assistant branch manager here. Uh, I've been with Western for seven years. Thank you, Keegan. Yeah, I'm Keegan. Uh, I'm in the St. Louis uh, roofing branch. Been with the company for 15 years. Courtney, thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Courtney Graham. I'm also with Western on the business development team, specifically on the sheet metal side. Um, I've been with Western since 2016. The one and only Aaron Tony. Go ahead. <laughs> everybody my name is aaron i work with uh western on the west coast uh work with multiple branches the picture that mike showed of all of the ships waiting to come into port is very true we were just at the driving by the beach the other day you could see more ships than i think i've ever seen out there in the water crazy thank yeah. you aaron all right so the first question that we have and um Everybody on the panel is going to answer this question because we want to just kind of get a point of view from each of the different like material sectors. So um, what are the current effects of the supply chain shortage um, in regard to um, concrete materials? And Aaron, if you wanted to go ahead and start that off. Yeah, I'll take that. The concrete one is the easy one. And I think Mike said it best, and that's not much. Uh, we're not seeing a, a huge impact on availability of concrete repair mortars. Uh, or ready mix products. Uh, so that's that's an exciting thing. Although the ancillary products that are included in a repair, uh, like epoxy, like the reinforcing bar, uh, if you need epoxy coated uh, reinforcing bar, sometimes that has a little bit longer of a lead time. Uh, what we're challenging our teams with is to try to, you know, have a good plan up front and communicate if you identify a shortage to let let our customer know that hey this this might be a little bit longer longer lead time but right now with respect to concrete repair materials uh we're we're sitting pretty good well that's good news um dave do you want to take the do you mind taking um the sealants and waterproofing yeah for sure um as far as sealants go whether it's silicone or urethane um those maybe have a little bit longer lead time than normal uh two to four weeks uh, so really having more of a look ahead on that, especially if you have a smaller project, it's not going to be something that you can just send a guy there same day and pick up some caulking like you would have before. It actually needs to be ordered much ahead of time uh, before actually scheduling the project. And then for waterproofing materials, um, most of them are pretty standard two to three weeks out. Some of them, depending on the manufacturer and where they've positioned themselves, with this current market, uh, they could be anywhere from three to four months out or longer. Um, and then further into that, um, if you have epoxies included into the traffic coating systems, those could be 
anywhere from eight to 20 weeks out. It really all depends. So planning ahead is key. Thank you, Dave. Mm -hmm. Keegan? Yeah, so uh, the roofing products have been heavily affected. Uh, I've talked to guys that have been in the industry for 40 years and have never seen anything like this. Uh, case in point, the last material order I tried to make, they told me 17 weeks. Uh, with certain materials, uh, there was talk of even the beginning of next year, uh, specifically like the steel products and some of the rigid roof insulation. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really, it's just started to hit us. Um, the issues are, even though the, the actual cause of it has been, uh, going on a while, we're really just starting to feel the pain. So, um, it, I see it going on for, for quite a bit longer. Thank you. Courtney, your turn. Yeah. So with sheet metal we're kind of all over the board depending on the type of material you're looking for but with steel you might think of that when you think of your roofing component so like your downspout scutters your scuppers things of that nature we typically would see um, a three to four day lead time but now we're seeing about three to four weeks on those types of the flat um, sheets that come in so it's significantly gone up there um also for the custom color metal, we typically would see 12 week lead time, which is pretty normal, but now we're seeing about 18 to 20 week lead time. And then for specialty metals like Firestone or Centria single panels, single skin panels, we're seeing about 12 to 16 weeks when typically it was eight to 10 weeks. So you're really looking at anywhere from three to eight week increase in lead time. The one um, item we're really not seeing much of a difference in is ACM or MCM, which is um, aluminum composite material or metal composite material, essentially the same thing. These are the type of panels you'd likely see on like dealerships or storefronts, but they're staying pretty steady at about two to three weeks. So, um, and that's delivery time, not fabrication time, but still that's good news nonetheless. So that's the only positive. Um, thing that hasn't changed in the sheet metal side of things, but everything else like the other components are severely increased in time. Thank you. So overall, it's affecting all of our, um, all of Western specialty contractors, different business lines and the materials that we use. Um, there's a few that haven't been as affected, but Kale, can you, do you mind, um, cause you work with several different manufacturers and contractors across the United States. Can you just give an overview um, of what you're seeing in, in, in the different sectors? Kale? Okay. Oh. Yeah, I'm uh, a little bit there. Um, yes, so we're just seeing the same type of delivery issues or delays that is mentioned by every aspect hey, of your team. Kale, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you we cannot hear you. You're um you're going in and out. So we'll we'll come back to you. Hopefully he's able to to fix that. Okay, so then the next question, we'll go back to Kale whenever he's able to um, join. Keegan, if you don't mind, go ahead and answer this. Um, can you just talk about what is the current state of material availability just overall? Yeah, so I kind of talked about that earlier as it pertains to roofing. I mean, we're just, we, we've never seen anything like this. So um, as Dave was saying, we have to plan ahead whenever we're dealing with this. And, you know, the, the biggest issue with, materials being so far out, plus the price seems to increase monthly, is that the price is different on the ship date than it was whenever the bid was actually put together and the proposal was signed. So I think the biggest change here, and this is something we've never done, is uh, try to try to get uh, like an escalation clause that allows for materials to increase um, after the, uh, the contract was signed. So the, the, the materials, you know, if they ship four months later, they're obviously going to be more. Once again, this is not something that that we're used to asking for, but it's something I think that the budget and and the owners uh, need to allow for. It's a good point, Keegan. Does anybody else have anything to add from the panel to that one? 
All right, we'll go ahead and move on. Um, so does Western have the buying power to receive material quicker and or at a lower price than their competitors? Aaron, you want to? Yeah, uh, well, the short answer is yes, but there's some caveats, right? Um, so Western as a whole has 30 branches across the company. Um, one thing that we realized not too long ago was that we weren't really taking advantage of our size. Um, we weren't really connecting the dots with customers across multiple markets, and we weren't leveraging uh, the size of our company and the buying power that we did have. So we recently, uh, not too long ago, developed kind of a national account program to address the customer side, but we also have an internal department within Western that focuses on uh, building and maintaining relationships with with key manufacturing partners across the U.S. And, and that group in itself has really helped us has really helped us from a side of developing great relationships with uh, a gentleman like Mike, who's on the, providing great in, great information about um, how they're seeing the marketplace. But they're also uh, somebody that that we that will give us some insight into trends and products as that as they move forward uh, uh, in, in these difficult times. Uh, but we do try to behave like Costco as well. I'd say there's certain products that we'll purchase in bulk when the when the timing is right. We'll inventory them and then ship them to branches. Uh, so that price benefit our customers are currently seeing. Uh, the ability to receive materials quicker. I think at times we can phone a friend, so to speak, and try to cut the production line to get in line first to receive the products. But I, I can't necessarily guarantee that that will exactly work every single time. Uh, we don't want to be that type of contractor who's asking for favors and and not planning for their projects accordingly. Uh, but we do do it at times. Uh, however, the one benefit that Western does have is because we have 30 branches nationwide, uh, we're able to send out internal correspondence and say, hey, does anybody have product XYZ? And we even had one earlier in the week where we were able to facilitate that that material need by uh, requesting or sending that request to another branch. And we can also, you know, ask other local offices to check with their distributors and their markets as well to see if they have any product. So I think the size of Western gives us an opportunity to uh, have the potential to get materials quicker because we have more resources on the ground. Uh, and, and we are able to also negotiate um, uh, local, regional, and national pricing uh, with the key distributors and manufacturers that I hope are lower than our competition, but I can't necessarily guarantee that, so. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah. So Kale was able to join us, is that right, Kale? I thought I heard him join. Maybe he's still having a problem. Kale, can you hear us? Okay, until we get that figured out, I think we'll skip forward. Oh. So if, and this is just a couple of questions. So if I already have a project under contract, what can I expect as it gets started and what can I do to minimize additional cost to the owner? Dave, can you take that question? Yeah, for sure. Um, so as you get started with the, the project that you already have under contract, um, good thing to have is regular progress meetings. And one of the first things to ask is what what are the long lead items? What What are the materials that you need to purchase to have this project happen? And this should be happening before the project even starts. Um, then you want to procure those materials and um, schedule the project happening accordingly. Uh, keep an open line of communication between the consultant and the contractor and the owner um, and bring up the discussion of if I can't buy material X, is it OK if we use material Y instead? Um, and then also, of course, you need to remain flexible with price increases as those come across if you want to maintain the project being completed. Thank you, Dave. Mm -hmm. Good point. Oh, 
and then what should we what should they do if my if their contractor is requesting to mix materials from different manufacturers and can you explain a little bit of what that means yeah so um you're you're never going to want to mix materials from two different manufacturers together um unless you have two manufacturers that completely agree that everything will work together and they're both going to give you a warranty and everything's going to be fine um but on a different note we had a project that we started last fall with manufacturer a where we did a couple rooms of some traffic coating um well then it came time for march for the larger portion of the parking garage to be completed well manufacturer a told us they're done making traffic coating until this storm is over so we then had to get creative and get on board with the consultant and the owner that they would allow us to use a different manufacturer in a different part of the building which we then ended up having to use two separate uh, warranties to warrant the product so you can use um different materials in a, in two different areas but you don't want to yes. use this, um, different material uh, manufacturers within one system. Correct. Okay. Tanya, if I could, um, I would say I totally agree. Just be careful whenever they interact with each other because the big issue is going to be compatibility. In mm -hmm. some cases, if you have one product that goes over, around, or near another one, just want to make sure they're compatible. And you can do that by talking to the, the manufacturers. Um, you know, just make sure you protect yourself because – too many times we've seen it, and not because of cases like this, but just in general, where product X gets applied over product Y, there's a problem, and they both do this. It's not my issue, it's his issue. You know, so, you know, we don't want to be put in that position. I'm sure the other people on this call don't want to be put in that position. So whatever we can do to help during this situation, we absolutely will. Uh, just be careful whenever things touch. That's where your biggest issue is. If you're doing one balcony with one product and another balcony with a different product, not as much of an issue because there's not a compatibility issue. But if you started half of a parking deck and now you're going to, you know, go on or adjacent, it, you got to really be careful there because it, it's going to have warranty implications and compatibility implications. Thank you. Bye. Bye. I, I think, Kale, are you are you joining us now? Poor Kale is having problems with his internet. Gonna give him one last try at it here. All right, well, I'll go back to these questions. I wanna try to see if he, oh, no, okay. <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> All right, so um, how does Western operate with the tradesman shortage? Um, Keegan, can you can you talk about that? Can you touch on that? Yeah, so, um, you know, the pandemic did not hurt us um, as much as it did like the bars and restaurants uh, from a labor perspective. You know, we've we've dealt with labor shortages for the better part of my career. So um, some things that we do to, to kind of get around that is invest in uh, equipment that that saves labor. Um, there's materials out there that that save labor. Um, so, so we try to use those things when we can, uh, we try to train the guys that we do have. We try to run leaner crews. Um, you know, once again, this is, it didn't hit us as hard as some of these, these other things. Uh, the last thing we did hire a recruiter recently, that's just concentrating on, uh, recruiting field personnel for the whole country. So, um, that's about it. Right, thank you. We have a couple of more questions and we'll get into the um, get into the participants questions. So this is a question for um, we're, we have somebody well, we'll have somebody from Western Sika and maybe Roof Tech um, join and answer this. So um, just so you get a different perspective. So what is the best way to move forward with 2021 capital projects? And Dave, do you want to take that from Western? Yeah, sure. Um, so from the contractor side, we would recommend getting the project under contract, um, moving forward with an open mind, plan ahead for long lead items, um, identify them early, and get in contract with the pricing for those items. Um, 
keep an open dialogue between the consultant owner and contractor as things change daily and hourly um, and then finally be flexible to allow for material price increases as they come along. Makes a good point. Mike, do you want to kind of just give it um, your opinion from a manufacturer standpoint? Yeah, I mean, I agree with a lot of stuff Dave said. I think, you know, a lot of these projects, maybe you, ha you normally have a, a monthly project meeting. It should probably be biweekly or weekly now because this process is changing. It's so dynamic, it's changing so fast um, that I think it's important for everybody. But, you know, from the manufacturer to the specifier, to the owner, to the contract, everybody should be having these conversations together because I think it's going to require a lot of creativity to, to move around the job site, maybe in a different order uh, or, you know, focus on different things. I think, you know, by being transparent up front, it allows us to really plan for what we can do, right? So it becomes less of what we can't do and more about what we can do so that we can keep the project moving forward. Um, so really, I would say communication is is 99% of what we're dealing with here. Uh, as long as, you know, the, the Western folks, I know you guys have always been really good communicating with people like us to make sure we can tell you what's coming, when to expect it. And then you guys can kind of pass that down the chain. But uh, if we're all in one room together, it makes it a lot easier, a lot quicker to have those conversations. So, you know, I, I know anybody uh, in our position would be under the same, you know, ideas. Let's get together. Let's have regular communications about what's coming down the road, what to expect. And, and, and that way we can really plan accordingly. Thank you, Mike. Um, so Kale was unable to join us. Um, he's having some major technical difficulties, so I'm going to have him answer the questions um, and then we'll send those out to all the participants um, afterwards just so that you guys can also get um, a contractor's or I'm sorry, consultant's perspective as well. But we're going to move on into, I believe, our final question. Um, and um, so what should ownership consider when budgeting for 2022 questions? And Aaron, if you don't mind. Oh, we're having a lot of technical difficulties today. Aaron, are you able to? Keegan, can you, are you able to answer this question? Yeah, I would say, you know, there's a chance that some of these jobs that were 2021 will turn into 2020. 22. So I think how your organization handles uh, those types of shifts is is going to change from from one to another. Um, you know, one thing I would say is, you know, a lot of people are thinking, you know, what happens if I just wait? You know, with all the uncertainty and price increases, let's just wait. I, I don't think that's a good move right now. I think you 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 know you get the you get the job scheduled, you get them under contract, order the material. You know, we're still putting one foot in front of the other and moving forward let's not just forget everything that we know and what we've learned uh, and, and throw it out the window so it, you know the price increases are what they are i don't really see them going down um but that's definitely something to keep in mind whenever you're planning for next year's projects um you know if things go up like lumber did uh there, that's going to be really tough to account for but you know i would i would allow for a higher than normal price escalation um and, you know get things on the schedule and uh go from there no i think that's great keegan and um i mean i think that right now you know if you're if you um represent the owners the ownership or you know a third party property manager um facility manager i think the biggest thing is honestly is just um being able to communicate to your ownerships or um, your asset managers and explain to them what's going on because I know a lot of times um, if they you, you put capital money in 2021 then a lot of ownerships say that it has to be completed in 2021 and it just may not be that case and so you know communicating with your engineers communicating with your consultant your contractor and your ownership I think is just probably the best thing that you can do at this point so a lot of questions or there's going to be a lot of question marks about you know lead times and and completion dates yeah, and Tanya, something else to think about, and Keegan made a really good point. It's not a time to wait because, you know, the business that we're in, whether it's the roofing side we've talked about or the restoration side, it's a business where the longer you wait, the worse the conditions are on the job. The roof is in, you know, disrepair. The building starts to fall apart more. And so what was, let's call it a million dollar 
restoration job. Now is a $1.5 million job because we've let the building go on and continue to degrade. And that's probably got a larger cost implication than the raw materials that we're talking about or the, the materials in this case. So it's just something to think about. And we run across this all the time in the, in the state of Florida where you know we have HOAs, um, board of directors that say, hey, we're just going to wait. We don't want to spend the money now, so we're going to wait. And the problem with that is, is what's a million dollars today becomes $3 million two years from now. And I'll be honest, as a material manufacturer, I can tell you, I don't care because I'll give it to you at 3000000 million, I'll give it to you at one. But you really have to be smart when you're managing these assets because the longer you wait on something that's in disrepair, the more it's going to cost you. Um, just keep that in mind. And sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it doesn't. But we really just need to understand that as we make these decisions. Thank you, Mike. So Jillian or Crystal, or when are you guys going to take the questions? Um, I know there was a few questions from the participants. I cannot unfortunately see them um, from my view since I'm sharing my screen, but. Jillian, are you able to take them or Crystal? Yeah, can you hear me? I can. Hi, Jillian. Hi, Tanya. Oh, real quick, Jillian, just I'm sorry. If anybody else has any questions, please either type them in um, to the comment section or just raise your hand and we will get to you. We want to make sure, you know, we're done with our section. We've still got about 30 minutes, so we have plenty of time for any um, questions that you guys have. So feel free to ask them. Go ahead, Jillian. Perfect. There were two questions that were unanswered. What does Western see as a typical lead time for Terracotta on restoration projects? I don't think we've addressed that yet. Nope, that's fine. Um, Dave, have you had any um, any history we, with um, Terracotta? And can you maybe touch on that question? Yes, but it, it's been years since we've done a Terracotta project in Minneapolis. Um, there's some that bid sporadically, more specifically at the Mayo Clinic. Um, from the last my last experience with it, it's 12 months to get it designed and another 12 months to get it fabricated and installed. So I, I believe it's still just as lengthy. Yeah, that and that's my understanding too, Dave. We have a um, terracotta job that we're looking at up in DC, and that's the same. Um, that was what I, the feedback I got too. I just didn't want to make sure I was incorrect. So thank you for answering that. <laughs> yep. Jillian, was there another question? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, what do you tell the builder when you can't get the material for three or four months and you tell him the best case scenario and he says he'll find someone else if he can't get it sooner? Who can? Can you, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yep. No. Um, no, that's an interesting question. So, um, Mike, do you want to talk about that really quick? I know... For me personally, and if anybody else wants to speak up, they can. Um, but I think Mike had really answered that question in the past where it's, you know, everybody's seeing the shortage, everybody's seeing the same issue. Um, and so, you know, like if you, if your ownership or, you know, your team decides, you know, maybe they could get it at a quicker somewhere else, um, probably not actually going to happen. But I mean, they're probably being a little less realistic, but Mike, can you go ahead and just briefly take that question? Yeah, listen, I, I mean, this is a, a conversation that we have several times a day these days. You know, um, there's always that scorned customer that calls saying, hey, listen, this is ridiculous. I can't believe it. I'm going to go somewhere else. And, you know, it's it's very tough. It's tough for a salesperson. It's tough for a manager. And and really the 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 answer that we've been giving is, hey, listen, we value you as a customer. We'd love to be able to help you. If you can find it somewhere cheaper, better, easier right now, you should do it. And I hope the door remains open for us to come back and do business together in the future. But the truth of the matter is if I can't do it, I can't do it. So, you know, I would like to say we're in a better position than most. We may be, we may not be, um, but we have to be honest and we have to be transparent with these people. So, you know, again, you know, we have to be nice about it. Look at, if, if you can do it, go do it. And, and I wish you the best. Uh, right now, I can't supply it or I won't be able to do this. And I think you got to be, you know, just honest. Honesty, what we found is a lot better than trying to to draw a customer along to keep the customer. Because in the end, you know, if if you don't live up to the expectation, it doesn't matter what you did on that job. You're not getting the next job anyway. Nope, nope, that, that's a great point. 
Mike. So yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, if somebody is able to get it for you, then you know that's that's uh, pretty rare right now. So if you're able to go with somebody else, I mean, obviously we would never want you to you know to do that, but we completely understand from your guys's you know perspective. And so if you do have somebody and you can get it in writing, then um, I think that you should definitely go that route. Um, Keegan, I don't know if you, Jillian, can you repeat the question about the asphalt and maybe Keegan, and just as much as you're comfortable with, maybe just kind of giving a roundabout answer and we'll have Kale touch base on that after um, the meeting. Sure. Hang on, sorry, I'm scrolling up. Oh, no, I, think, okay. I think we um, talked about this one already. Was it, This was about specifying asphalt products over traditional roofing material that we're using nowadays. Is that it? Yeah. Um, and I think so, so the answer is, I mean, the problem with roofing is there's so many materials that go into roofing and all it takes is one being held up to put off the whole job. So whether that's, uh, you know, it could be some sort of asphalt primer or it could be the fasteners or, you know, it could be anything. So. Um, switching products in this case, I mean, maybe it helps you in a very specific situation, but there's a chance there's uh, other products that are going to hold the job up that are, that is being used, whether you go with the TPO or a modified asphalt. So uh, I think point. it's something you keep in mind, but at the end of the day, you're, we're still going to have uh, supply issues. Thank you. Jillian, has any other questions came through? Yeah, would you touch on the importance of inspections and preventative maintenance to help help postpone re-roofing? You know what, that's actually a really good point. That was something I wanted to add in here and I had, I forgot about it now, I'm angry with myself. So um, Keegan, do you wanna kind of touch base on um, doing like the being proactive on repairs yeah. while you're waiting for your project? Yeah, I mean, so we have entire slideshows or in presentations just about this topic. So. Obviously, it's always important, but now it becomes more important than ever as we're trying to milk everything we can out of these roofs. You know, a lot of times uh, when people come to us, they need a roof replacement. It, they're not really in a position to wait uh, because they've already been waiting and, and putting it off for five plus years. Um, but with that being said, you know, let's try to make what we have last longer. And the best way to do that is you know, perform the regular inspections, uh, whether that be in-house plus plus doing one, uh, you know, by a roofing professional, a consultant, um, you know, doing the repairs, doing the proactive repairs, making sure your drains aren't clogged up and, and prematurely degrading your roof. So uh, obviously, you know, those are some things you can do. They require smaller amounts of material um, for the repairs as opposed to roof replacement. So they are definitely first and foremost uh, more important now than than ever. So, thank you, Crystal. Did you say that there was maybe a question that did not get answered out there? Well, I was just kind of reviewing the chat box, and I wasn't sure if anyone asked the question or answered the question. How does a contractor who has a force majeure clause? obtain this documentation if the manufacturer isn't force major majeure. That is a good question. And I, oh, is that, Mike, is that your hand, please? Yeah, listen. Because I said, I'm not sure. <laughs> this is a really big issue in the industry right now. Um, and is really a, a major discussion with contract law. Um, a lot of contractors, because of COVID, began putting force majeure clauses into their contracts. Um, here's the issue. Number one, just having the existence of a force majeure clause does not mean that either party is excused from their obligation. And so that's what's really being argued about on the legal sense these days. Um, you know, force majeure clauses on a contractor sense are more kind of tilted towards well, if we're working on your building and a hurricane comes and blows the building down, well, then I'm not obligated anymore to fulfill my obligation to you. So it's, it's what we're dealing with now is 
force majeures that come two or three steps down the line, meaning a raw material manufacturer in Texas declares force majeure. Sika can't make the product now because they declared force majeure. I can't get the product because Sika can't make it. That's where we are right now. And that's really what's being discussed um, at very high levels in the legal system, because how do you enforce that force majeure? I would say, you know, to Rob, I know Rob asked that question to Rob Flynn. You know, one of the things that you can do, all of these companies that declared force majeure, and there was probably almost two dozen of them throughout Texas that did this. Um, it's all public knowledge. So you have to be able to show the connectivity, meaning Sika uses this raw material from this. And so what I would say is if it's specific to a manufacturer that you're using, I would ask the manufacturer if they can somehow pull that force majeure letter, right? So whether it was Dow or Olin or one of these guys that was making raw material that declared force majeure, that letter is going to be step one. It's still an argument in the court, you know, because the court's going to say, well, you have alternatives. Well, you might have this. So it's a very, very sticky wicket right now. Um, but certainly there's things you can do to kind of make it a little easier. And I say the first thing is if, if, if the manufacturer is holding you up and we didn't declare for sure, we generally won't. Um, but if we didn't do it, I think um, you, you really have to, to gain as much information you can get the letters, talk to the manufacturer see if they'll provide a letter as to how they're affected and provide it to the contractor so that they can, you know, educate whoever needs it. Um, but it's still an argument. It's still going to go to court. It's still going to get litigated. It's still going to be argued. Um, it's new. We've never really had to deal with this. So they're still trying to figure out how you do it. Well, I'm really glad that you jumped in to answer that question because I got a little anxious and I did not know. So I learned something today. So thank you. <laughs> Anything that has to do with legal, nobody wants to talk about. Yeah, exactly. Um, like, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> so what questions do we have? The next question we have is, do you feel like the contractors who sell a roof in a bucket known as coatings now have some advantage when it comes to re-roof applications? Kagan. I guess that's me. Sure. I could answer, but it sounded like you wanted to. <laughs> um, once again, he's kind of putting a, a negative connotation on coatings and some of it's well deserved if the coatings aren't installed properly. Um, but, you know, we're, there's quote unquote roof in a bucket out there that uh, could be definitely a good solution now if you can get a hold of it. You know, sometimes, you know, if the issue is getting hold of the material, not the price. Um, you you got to consider all options here. So um, maybe a high performance roof coating system, uh, liquid roofing system could be a, you know, a possible solution now. And I think it's something that we need to take into account. If you're a good roofer, um, you're already using these uh, coatings, uh, liquid applied systems, you know, as a, a, a tool or a weapon in your arsenal. Um, to, to attack different roofs and customers as needed. So definitely something to consider uh, moving forward. We also have a hand raised, um, Bob. Yeah, yeah, I have a, a question to put to the group. And that being when you can manage to source, say, EPDM or TPO, certain millage, certain reinforcing, whatever, whatever the specs are, but you can only get so much of one manufacturer and so much of another manufacturer. Is anybody experiencing um, how and who would be willing to uh, back a warranty to that system because it's made up of different manufacturers? Is there anybody that's willing or any companies that are willing to back up that warranty? Is that... Keegan, or does that kind of fall under you, or is that more of a master question? Yeah, um, we ran into that situation, and you know, every situation is different, and they so they have to be addressed as such. But in our situation, we had one manufacturer that uh, was specified, and that when what we were doing the job with, and we ran out of screws, uh, but we had readily available screws from another manufacturer. Now, screws are obviously very mechanical in nature. Um, it seemed like an easy swap. 
we asked the manufacturer if it was okay if we use these other screws. And, and we're talking, you know, two boxes out of 24. Uh, so not a large part of the job. But uh, we got it in writing beforehand and, and it was approved. So in that situation, we are able to do that and still get the warranty. But I would definitely proceed with caution um, when doing this, you know, on other types of projects. You know, if you're talking coatings, uh, you can't use one, a primer from one manufacturer and, you know, a top coat or a base coat from another. So, you know, those is, those situations it's, it's going to be pretty <laughs> sticky and i don't think any any manufacturer would stand by or, or warrant that kind of a system but uh for certain situations like mine it made sense and we were able to get it done okay i appreciate it. that makes sense but um this is more of a manufacturer of of membrane not necessarily a, a coating which needs to be pro proprietary i'm thinking more along the lines of an epdm or like i said a tpo but uh, I appreciate it. Thanks. Get it in writing. Yeah, if it was the EPDM itself, uh, you're talking about the top wearing membrane. That that's going to be a, a really hard sell. I mean, at best, maybe you section the roof up if you can and make one section one manufacturer and one section another. Uh, but now you're talking about swapping out all the rest of the materials as well. So, I, I would say that's a pretty tough go. If you decide to do that, you're probably um, giving up the, you know, extended no dollar limit warranty that uh, are typical with roofing systems now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions out there? I don't see any questions in the chat. All right. Well, following we again, um, we absolutely appreciate you guys joining today. I hope that you found it beneficial and that you learned something. I know that I did. Um, I have the email address for everybody that signed up for the um, for the webinar. So I will send out a link to the recording if you want to share with your friends. Um, and also, I will send some contact information um, for the people that were on this call in case you have any follow up questions. And then we'll also have um, Roof Tech answer the questions that he so that you guys can kind of get a consultant's or that you can get a consultant's point of view from. Um, but again, thank you so much for joining. Uh, we hope that you guys had it, found it beneficial and happy Wednesday. Thank you, Tanya. Thanks, thank Tanya. You. See ya. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Great Bye. job, guys.